Welcome to Beyond the Chain, the podcast from Nash that takes a deep look into blockchain technology and connects the dots between decentralized finance, business, and the wider world. I'm your host, Chris Fenwick, and each week I'm joined by a Nash founder and a special guest. This week, here with me is Nash co-founder Ethan Fast. Hey, Chris. And also joining us is Anita Posh, one of the most prominent voices in the German language Bitcoin community. Anita hosts the Bitcoin und Co. podcast, which is also the title of her introductory guide to Bitcoin for German speakers. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ethan. Hey, Anita. So would you like to tell us a bit more about your background, like what you did before Bitcoin, how you found out about it and what sorts of things you do now? Yeah, great. I'd love to. Thank you for the introduction. Actually, I studied urban planning. I'm, I feel myself, I'm a little bit of a generalist because after uh, working a little bit in the urban planning field, I decided in the year 2000 that uh, the internet is here and it's a great thing. And I immediately knew I want to work in this space. So I started as a web designer. I uh, founded online platforms and e-commerce marketplaces, something um, like a small Etsy for Austria and Germany, for instance. And uh, through this web development and project work, I came into touch with e-commerce payment systems and all the hassle that's around that with all the regulation and the complicated ways to find a payment provider, how much you have to pay because this is like 15 years ago, yeah? There was no Stripe where you uh, don't need to pay upfront. So you really, in that years, you had to pay upfront to be even able to use a payment service. And for a small business as ours, this was a great hurdle, actually. It's, it's actually quite interesting uh, trying to do this in Germany because um, I've lived in Germany for the last 10 years or so, and they seem to be very behind other countries in terms of adopting payment technology. <laughs> that might be. And also, you know, Wirecard is from Germany and it was led by an Austrian. So <laughs> um, that's not a good connection to payment uh, services. At the beginning of 2017, I was at the conference and there was uh, Sherman Forschungier. She's an economist and a scientist and she's working around blockchains and Bitcoin. I heard her keynote and immediately I knew, okay, that thing is interesting to me. I want to get into this. I want to know more about it. And then I started to research on Bitcoin and blockchains and found out about people like Andreas Antonopoulos. And from then on, I did the the MOOC at the University of Nicosia. There is a free MOOC where you can learn directly from Andreas, for instance, about Bitcoin and blockchains. From then on, I had it full into it and uh, decided I want to make a living through education in this space because I really think that Bitcoin is an important tool in our lives and in our economy to have a kind of an alternative to the existing financial system. And then I thought, okay, I need something. I need a product. And that was the reason why I then wrote the, the beginner's guide. And when I had that, I met Andreas Antonopoulos because he was in Vienna for a conference and I'm one of his Patreons and for his Patreons he does meetups and I showed him the book and asked him if he would like to come to a podcast interview and that was the start actually. Afterwards I I said I I would love to help him out and if I can support him and then the idea came that they were asking me if I would like to translate the internet of money to German and I did that from then on, I just started a German online course, how to get into Bitcoin, how to safely store it and where to buy it and stuff. So, and doing the podcast. Yeah. So that's actually what I'm doing at the moment. And I'm very happy that I found that. Great. I guess for something that wants to be a global currency, it's actually very important to have lots of materials in different languages, not just in English, because not everybody can educate themselves about blockchain if they can't really read original materials in English. Yeah, that's true. And uh, there are actually always, uh, from time to time, I have people who tell me they can't listen to my English podcasts because um, they, they are in, their English is not good enough. And most of the educational material is in English, but more and more we also get translations from the books and also courses and stuff. 
Yes, sir. It's a very important job that, that you're doing. So to move on to some other questions, one of the topics you've talked a lot about is financial inclusion. So would you like to explain to our listeners what financial inclusion is and who's affected when there isn't enough of it? Hmm. Actually, it's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in Bitcoin. For me, financial inclusion means that everybody around the world has equal access to financial services, regardless of gender, color, wealth, education or location, that everybody has financial services at hand or available that enable them as individuals or businesses to store and save money securely and to have access to loans, to equity, and just the possibility also to act on their own behalf. Because in uh, 2018, it was estimated that about 1.7 billion adults lacked a bank account. So they don't have access to a bank account. And among those, a uh, significant number are women and poor people in rural areas. Those people often also face discrimination and belong to vulnerable or marginalized populations. In high-income economies, for instance, 94% of adults have an account, a bank account, but in developing economies, it's only 60%. And um, even as the account ownership in the last years has grown, the inequalities persist. So uh, like 72% of men have an account, but only 65% of women do. And this gap has not really gone smaller in the last years. It has stayed the same. You also know that racial inequality also leads to wealth inequality. So I found a number which is really embarrassing. I mean, the median net worth of black households in 2016 was 17,150 US dollars, while the median net worth of a white family at the same time was 171 US dollars, so ne nearly 10 times as much. And also, don't forget the Hispanic group. They are also lagging behind the white people wealth. So, of course, it's a thing of education on the one hand, but also I think it's a thing of being in a specific circle of people, you know, who are your peers? What do they have? Which access do they have to financial assets, let's say, you know, because, for instance, it's also in Austria is a country most people save cash or it's called Sparbuch in Austria. So it's just money in the bank. People don't participate in the stock markets, for instance. So only 5 to 7% of Austrians hold stocks, the same in Germany, while in, in the Netherlands is 30%. And we know that if you hold money, you basically lose value because you don't get interest anymore, so you can't really save. Another big group which I would like to add here is, of course, the group of women worldwide. The hurdles that prevent women from accessing financial services are long distances, for instance, in Africa to access money or banks. And they also need a level of privacy that allows them to protect their savings from others. And almost a billion women worldwide cannot or don't have a basic bank account. In many cultures, it's also men who traditionally own the land or house and women cannot inherit a house or something like that. So imagine if you require a, a, a loan and the lender asks for a collateral, you don't have a collateral as a woman because, um, yeah, you don't inherit it. That are the, the basic reasons, I think, why women are also excluded from this system and generally underserved by the financial services industry. But the interesting thing is we don't only have that in so-called underdeveloped countries. We also have it in, in Europe, in France, Italy, Poland, United Kingdom. There where 55% of the financially excluded people are women. And in the United States, two-thirds of the unbanked are women. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we don't know about that. And there, I think... Bitcoin is really a very accessible tool because you don't need an account. You you basically, yeah, if you don't go to a KYC exchange, <laughs> you can have Bitcoin without any uh, formalities, you know. So, um, and that is the, the basic idea for me why I think Bitcoin is so important because you only need a mobile phone 
and somebody who introduces you to it. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's like such an important use case that people don't often think about when they think about cryptocurrencies. Um, just thinking about this from Nash's point of view, one of the reasons that we were so excited about starting this company was to tackle the user experience problem in the space. Basically, the accessibility of the interfaces that exist to access and manage cryptocurrencies is still pretty bad overall. There are all these concepts that people need to understand to be able to use them and to use them safely. Um, so I'd be curious, how do you feel about the accessibility just from a technological point of view right now? And sort of what kinds of things do you think that we could do to improve that accessibility, right? So, you know, basically getting these people who don't have these other more traditional financial options into the system, it, it's a totally open system, but you still have to make the technology itself accessible. So do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I was in Zimbabwe earlier this year and I learned a lot there um, how Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies should be made accessible for these people there. Because, for instance, they have power shortages. So um, you only have power from 11 p.m. to 5 in the morning. Or uh, so how do you make a Bitcoin payment when your mobile phone has run out of energy? Or many people do not have or most people do not have access to the World Wide Web. They buy so-called internet bundles, meaning they have a mobile phone and buy a package or a bundle for WhatsApp, for instance. So they can use WhatsApp or Facebook, but they can't use the World Wide Web. So how do they download a wallet, a non-custodial wallet, and install it on their phones? They can't because they don't have the money uh, to access the internet. Yeah, also, I've seen the the usability, for instance, for mobile money in Zimbabwe. There it's called EcoCash. Um, you have that in Kenya with M-Pesa. It has increased the financial inclusion because everybody can use it. You don't need an ID because that's also a problem very often that people don't have an ID. And you need that for a bank account, but you don't need it for Bitcoin and also not for EcoCash, for instance. So... You only need to have a phone. You don't even need a plan or, or pay for the phone, um, like your mobile plan. You can receive EcoCash immediately. So people use that extensively in Zimbabwe. 85% of all transactions are made with EcoCash there. And um, But, you know, the problem with money, mobile money is it's centralized again. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're depending on the company and also on the uh, government. And, yeah, so I think it would be really important that on the one hand, we have lightning integration, meaning that poor people, because they can't afford a Bitcoin base layer transaction, they would need lightning because it's microtransactions that they need. So that is one thing. Um, they should be able to earn it in a way, to do work for it, to earn uh, Bitcoin. And also, we need to find a way to send and receive Bitcoin uh, cryptocurrencies in things like Telegram or WhatsApp or on Facebook. And also key management, you know, is an yeah. uh, important question. So at the moment, you would say that this uh, centralized eco cash has got a lot of adoption, but is there a Bitcoin community in Zimbabwe, for example? Did you meet anybody from that community there or people yeah. who are using Bitcoin there? Yeah, I, I went there to research on that and I did a six part uh, podcast series on that topic, like Bitcoin in Zimbabwe, because, you know, you always hear Zimbabwe and Venezuela are the places for Bitcoin because of hyperinflation and such. And it's true. It's true that this is the ideal region to use Bitcoin. And I met with some people who are already using Bitcoin. They, for instance, one guy, he's an affiliate marketer. He's doing online business and he's doing work for companies from abroad. And so he gets paid in Bitcoin. And I'm pretty sure he also knows because all Africans know that the US dollar, for instance, is worth much more than their own currency. And especially in Zimbabwe, because um, they are in hyperinflation inflation mode again. So with Bitcoin, they, on the one hand, get money inside very easily and also outside of the country very easily. You cannot do that with the Zimbabwean national currency. And also the banking system is completely broken down and everything is corrupt, you know, there. 
So I met with some people and talked with them. And I think one of the use cases also is trading. People in Africa like to uh, trade because, I mean, they, they, they can earn money through it. And there is also a lack of jobs there. And I mean, in African nations, the average age is 25 years, you know, so the people want to work, they need work. And I think that the African continent will be uh, the next big place for cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned some of the problems that people in developing countries face when it comes to accessing the internet. What are the other major challenges that you see in the way of blockchain and cryptocurrencies leading to greater financial inclusion? What are the main issues that we'll have to overcome? It's education. I mean, and really education on the ground. Actually, people, you should be there and show them how it works because it's hard to educate just by saying something or showing you a video. You need people, you need peers who show you how it works and that it works and that it's not a scam. And one of the challenges um, is the thought that uh, KYC and AML regulations will save us from terrorism and crime and child abuse and stuff, you know. Um, I think this is one of the biggest challenges in a way, because then people need an ID again. They uh, cannot use Bitcoin, maybe. I mean, they can because you can use it without an ID, but they maybe not will not know that, you know. So then again, they cannot be, uh, they cannot have an account on their own. And so... Um, I think this is also a problem, yeah. I mean, we we do allow people to use the exchange up to uh, $1,000 a day. And so like for a lot of people, that's not a lot of money. But for for many oh. people, that actually is quite oh. a lot of money, right? Well, that's that's huge. <laughs> for developing countries, right? Like, yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, yeah, I guess what I was kind of trying to get at is maybe we can find a good middle ground, right? So, you know, if terrorism and, and money laundering stuff is really focused on high value accounts, maybe we can open up the financial system to, you know, people who are in need of it the most, who, who probably don't have those super high value accounts and, and get the benefits. Yes, of course. I mean, this is exactly what I think Bitcoin is for, to overcome these hurdles, you know. So on your exchange, it's a thousand a day. That's so much money um, it, that will be feasible for uh, people in developing nations. I, I mean, I think this gets a bit complicated because some of these these laws obviously depend on the jurisdictions of different yeah, countries. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what what actually, what is the regulation regarding cryptocurrency like in say Zimbabwe? Actually, the, they 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 don't have one. I think at the moment, the problem with Zimbabwe is it's a country um, where people do not have basic human rights. And there are currency controls, so you cannot send out money from the country to another country freely. You have to ask the Central Bank of Zimbabwe if you are allowed to. Then you have the problem that, of course, this regime wants to control the money. And so in 2017, there was also a big spike in Bitcoin usage in Zimbabwe. And um, a lot of people, there was an exchange, uh, which was called Golix, and they even had a Bitcoin ATM in the capital of, of Harare, where you could sell your Bitcoin and get US dollar cash out of the machine, which is an unthinkable thing in a way, because there are also US dollar shortages. Getting US dollar cash is very difficult there. So people are um, left to use the national currency that is losing value every day. And in 2017, many people also got scammed with scammers who used Bitcoin as a medium. And they went to the central bank and then the central bank said, yeah, because of so much scams, they shut the exchange down and that was it with, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies there. The latest thing I know is that the government before, that was before COVID-19 came, they were planning their own cryptocurrency with an American company. Um, so I guess it should have been a permissioned or will be a permissioned blockchain uh, where they will uh, yeah, um, give out their own national currency. But I mean, this has nothing to do with an open blockchain system. 
When you look at uh, the development that's going on in the crypto space at the moment, do you think that the majority of teams really appreciate these kinds of issues? That's the reason why I went there and why I made this podcast series, because I wanted to shine a light on these groups of people. What, has, what means groups? There are billions of people, you know, and we in the European and, and the so-called Western world, we always tend to forget other people. You know, we are spoiled by our high level of uh, life, which is great, but If you look around in the world, there is actually a quite bigger number of people who lack basic supplies. And I think um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies can adopt much faster if we would also integrate those people also into the development more. I mean, I know from some uh, guys in Africa who one of them, Tim Akimbo, for instance, he's a Bitcoin core developer, you know, which is great, but he's like one in, I don't know how many. So it would be great um, if um, we could work together more with people from these countries. So I guess this brings us to the Second topic we wanted to discuss, which is the idea of Bitcoin and blockchains democratizing money. So what's your philosophy around that? What does it look like? Yeah, I, if we look at the history of money and at the current situation, all nation state currencies like the US dollar, the euro, the yen, all of them worldwide are so-called fiat money. Because since 1971, none of those currencies is backed by gold or by any other asset anymore. Uh, fiat comes from the Latin word uh, fieri and it means let it be done. So It says basically this money comes out of thin air, out of nowhere. And our money has its value because the state, the government, makes it legal tender through law. We have to use it. We pay our taxes with it. Then there's also high demand for it, of course. But money in the end is a language to express how valuable a thing for us is. And in the fiat system, money is created through an entry in a ledger. It's basically a number in an accounting system. And who is in charge of the creation of money? It's governments. It's central banks together with commercial banks. So it's It's a centralized hierarchical system with gatekeepers. It's not inclusive. And this system over the last 200, 300 years allowed a financial elite to grow. I think there are unspoken and unseen barriers for entry. I think maybe you can compare it to the glass ceiling that women face in their careers when they are not entering company boards or higher management ranks. And uh, the circle around the banking institutes and central banks, they benefit from the so-called Cantillon effect, which is a, a, a term uh, coined by a French uh, Richard Cantillon in the 1600s, I think, who said that people who are close to the new creation of money profit from it as the first people. They are the first people that get hold of the money. And as the new supply spreads out to the other people, the supply uh, has, going, has been going up and the value of the money has been going down. So basically, people close to the money supply, they profit the most. And yeah, I think... Yeah, um, yeah. I guess maybe just to, to discuss a couple of points related to that. So I guess that you can argue that it's not inherently bad. In fact, it might even be necessary to have a certain degree of inflation in the money supply. Because if the money supply remains fixed or decreases, people are not actually incentivized to spend their money because the value of the money would go up over time. So they would save it and therefore they yeah. wouldn't go and contribute where... to the economy. Yeah, but, but... where... Sorry. Yeah, so, so it's not necessarily that the problem is with a certain degree of inflation. It's the institutions that manage that, that if you give a loan to, you create money through a loan that's given to your friends, for example. Yeah, I mean, I agree on the second point. The first point, I'm not uh, completely agreeing upon. I think that this everlasting circle of inflation, inflation and inflation and spending and spending and spending leads to the point where we are now, 
that, um, and I don't mean with COVID, I mean in general, um, we need to, um, how, how is it called in English? We need to make, we need to, all our services, all the things we build, everything has to be sold for money because we need the money to pay back the loans. And this is a, a circle that gets us, us deeper and deeper on the one hand into this consuming uh, of things and we have to, I mean, I think on the one hand, I don't say that Bitcoin uh, has or will replace the current system immediately or something like that, but it's an alternative, you know, it's an alternative um, where I maybe appreciate saving more and then I buy something because I really want it or I need it. And I think for the sake of the planet, this would also be a reasonable um, point of view or way to go, you know. Um, so I don't think that it's bad that money that increases in value um, is saved over time, because on the on the other side we still use our fired system, you know. And yeah, speaking of institutions, you are completely right about that. Yeah, I do definitely agree with is uh, there is a tendency I think in our society to put value on spending as kind of the end in itself, right? So if you look at like measures of success, right? We're, we're looking at things like GDP, right? Mm -hmm. and, and GDP doesn't actually tell you, is this a good society? Are people happy in the society, right? It's just a measure of growth and it actually measures growth itself in a very kind of biased way. One question I have when we think about Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and their potential for democratizing money, I think one common critique that gets raised, and I, I think I would put this sort of in a, it's a kind of a separate class of critique from what we've been talking about, but I'm just curious to get your reaction to it, is that if you look at like Bitcoin itself, its distribution is actually quite unequal as well, right? So if you look at like the wallets that hold Bitcoin, there are a few early adopters who control a very large portion of the Bitcoin that exists. And that I think it's possible to be much more nuanced about this and say like, okay, well, you know, that's a separate issue from accessibility, right? If we're just treating this as a currency, but I'm curious, do you have any thoughts about the implications for the inequality in the actual distribution of those Bitcoin assets? Yeah, I know what you mean. And I also thought about that a lot. I mean, of course, it's true. If you have been early in the game and you spent time on understanding it, uh, or you mined Bitcoin, or you bought it at a very early time, uh, then you are very well off now. And um but you also needed to be able to hold it for that long. I mean, and a lot of people lost their keys or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and um, yeah, you're right, of course. Um, I mean, the people who used it at first, they also risked a lot in a way, you know. And um, I also see a tendency that I, I cannot say the proportion of how many people, how many Bitcoin whales there are and how ma many of those uh, spent, respent the money, put it back into the Bitcoin community for, to, to for instance, pay for uh, developers or startups in this space. So the money... Um, gets into a, into the circle economy. I cannot tell you to which uh, amount or proportion, but um, yeah, I mean. Right, right. Yeah, yeah there's like a sort of level of reinvestment at some level. I, I also think mm -hmm. like um, something you said earlier is really relevant to this. You were talking about how sort of the, I forget, you called it uh, some principle, uh, I forget the name of it, but you said the people closest to the generation of the supply benefit. Um, mm -hmm. And so while it might be the case that, you know, many, many people have massive Bitcoin holdings because they were early, they're not necessarily like any closer to the supply than anybody else, right? They just, they just hold the asset. And so if you, if you think about inequality in other countries, um, I, I, I mean, really, this is a complicated issue and it depends how you define it, but maybe there's an argument that, you know, the people who, who do control all these, all this wealth, uh, in, in these other countries are in some sense closer to the supply and have more influence over the policies, uh, how the money is generated, all of these things. Whereas that's actually maybe not true for Bitcoin, even though it also is in some sense unequal. 
Yeah, it's in some sense, you're right. But And that's the thing about democratizing access to the supply of money, you know. And it's also, you could say then, okay, but now when the price is surging and it gets more expensive and expensive, then the poor people cannot participate anyhow. And I say, it's true, they might not be able to buy one whole Bitcoin, but still they can participate in the system, they can use it freely. They can, it's uncensorable. Nobody can take it away from them. They can transact worldwide freely. So it's the utility, you know, I think, mm. which is important for people, even if the price would fall down to 1000 US dollar again, or maybe $500, people still can use it. And I think that's, that's the more important part for me, at least, than um, to gain uh, huge wealth, you know? Right, right. You you bring up the point about um, environmental sustainability of our consumption habits. But this is also a bit of an elephant in the room when it comes to Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is secured by the energy that's required to compute the, the hashes for securing the network, right? You know, people want to mine Bitcoin in countries where it's cheap to obtain energy. But ultimately, like the price of the Bitcoin is going to end up sort of oscillating around the cost of mining the Bitcoin. Because if it's costing more money to mine Bitcoin than you can sell the Bitcoin for, then fewer people are going to mine the Bitcoin. So there's going to be less competition and then it will sort of adjust upwards and likewise in the other direction. So if Bitcoin sees very high adoption and achieves a very high value, then the energy that would be required to secure the network because of all the competition going on for it, because of the, the sheer profitability of mining those coins, those energy costs could skyrocket, which would not necessarily be very good for the planet. Yeah. I mean, that's true. That's a concern I also have. But the the problem in itself is not the use of the energy, but the CO2. Yeah. So I think that's that's the problem. So basically, I would be for all people who use energy from unsustainable resources need to pay uh, something on top because they are producing CO2. I, I think it doesn't make sense to say, ah, but the banking system also needs electricity and we cannot uh, measure that. And so we don't know how much they need. I mean, how much do they need? But I think we should not play this out against each other because everybody has different um, values of what is important to them, you know. And for me, the advantages of Bitcoin as a tool for financial inclusion are higher than uh, maybe the use of electricity for it. And with Bitcoin, you can go to places where nobody else can go to mine Bitcoin. And there are different studies about that. And one of those says 70% of the electricity that is used for Bitcoin mining comes from sustainable uh, resources, like for instance, Iceland, or also from overproduction uh, at different um, hydroelectric sources. So yeah, I think, and you're right, I mean, if the network grows, also the electricity needs will grow. But often I also hear uh, with more transactions, there will be more need for electricity. This is not true because with the Lightning Network, we will have most of the transactions on the second layer and there we don't need mining. So, yeah. So you, you yeah. focus a lot on, on Lightning as the solution to some of the, these problems. So you're definitely committed to seeing Bitcoin as the one chain that will remain rather than being replaced by another chain with a, a different kind of consensus model, for example. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, I can't foresee the future. So I, I don't say Bitcoin is the one and only and it will be that in 20 years. Maybe another mining algorithm or any other technology comes along. But I think that Bitcoin will adopt that then too, maybe, you know. So there's always the possibility to, to change and uh, optimize it. But I mean, yes, I, I believe in Bitcoin, but there, there's a chance, of course, that uh, something else um, will become the leading cryptocurrency. But I, I still hope that it's an open blockchain with all its properties that it has. What do you think that the general public or people like us uh, who live in prosperous and democratic countries, what do you think that we could do to help with financial inclusion, whether or not it relates to blockchain or not? 
Mm. I think it's a difficult question because we all feel very small in this big world, but I think it's the small things that can make a difference in, in, uh, in general. Um, I think um, it's important to be aware of the status and the possibilities we have while living in a high developed country. I know everybody is suffering at the moment from uncertainty, maybe job loss, illness, and from fear about what the future will bring. And it's important to be open to learn about new technologies and educate yourself about Bitcoin and other blockchains. Education is the best way to start. And don't forget about the fact that you might be privileged and be aware of what you have and step into the shoes of others from time to time and see what they are seeing or, or feeling or have to live through. And then plan accordingly. <laughs> Thank you very much for the for the fascinating conversation. Thanks to Ethan for being here with us. Yeah, thanks, Chris and, and Anita. That was an amazing conversation. Thanks so much for coming on. Yes, thanks. thanks. Thanks a lot, Anita. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. And thank you to everyone who listened to Beyond the Chain. Don't forget, you can subscribe with your favorite listening stream so you don't miss an episode. The full text of this episode will be available on podcast.nash.io.